All right, so welcome back from the break. This is the last session of the day. We're very happy to start with Shiraz Minwala from TIFR, who will tell us about the Hilbert space of Trin Simon's meta theories. Take it away, Shiraz. Uh, thank you, Veronica. I would really have liked to be in Brazil for this meeting, but so it goes. Okay, my talk today is based on work to appear done in collaboration with Sachin Jain, myself, uh, Amir Mishra, Naveen Prabhakar, and Tarun Sharma. And um, uses work uh, performed on the large and limit of uh, partition functions in matter and Simon series over over ten years. References here. Okay, so let's let's start. So Chern Simon's theory is coupled to dynamical matter fields are of interest for several reasons. Uh, the first is just universality. The Chern Simon's action is the most relevant term for gauge dynamics. And so if you've got a gauge theory in three dimensions without parity, uh, chances are that it will be governed by Chern Simon's action in the far infrared. And if you're a bit fine tuned, Chern Simon's theory coupled with matter. Um, the second reason is that the Chern Simon's coupling, which is sort of like one over the level, doesn't flow because integers cannot, or inverses of integers cannot continuously flow. And so Chern Simon's theories very easily generate uh, conformal dynamics, even in the absence of supersymmetry. Um, third, Chern Simon's matter theories host anionic excitations, which have interesting and unfamiliar and interesting physics. Um, they have non half integer spins. Um, the S matrices display unusual crossing properties. We were just discussing the discussion session. Fourth, some of these theories have conjectured ADS CFT duals ranging from the usual, like ABGM theory, to the exotic, like Vasiliev theory. So some of these theories, now there's fantastic evidence, uh, obey, uh, obey um, invariance under a strong weak coupling type post Fermi duality. Um, this is perhaps the strongest, simplest uh, non supersymmetric duality um, in uh, higher than two dimensions that, that at least I know about. And sounds like uh, um, interesting to study, even from the point of view of understanding duality better. And the sixth, and most importantly for my talk, these John Simon's matter theories admit two interesting solvable limits. The first one's very familiar, it's more than 30 years old. It's the limit in which you take all the matter and make it massive, then it becomes pure John Simon's theory, which has an exact and beautiful and lovely solution, which we understand very, very well. The second, which has been studied now for almost 10 years, is a limit in which it, uh, a case in which you take John Simon's matter theories, make the put the matter in the fundamental representation, and uh, take the Toft larger limit. In this limit, uh, n goes to infinity, the level of the Chern Simons theory goes to infinity. And it's traditional to define the Toft coupling as n divided by n plus kappa, you know, the renormalized level of the Chern Simons theory. Uh, that, that stays fixed. Uh, the theory is solvable also in this new and sort of unusual or uh, unusual limit. Now, solvable limits of theories are special. Okay, the ill Hilbert spaces of such theories often in, exhibit great, very elegant mathematical structure. Um, and uh, sometimes they're obtained by from sort of de simple deformations or simple constraints on free theories. In this talk, I will attempt to argue that um, the solvable limit that I just talked about, namely this large n Toft limit of fundamental matter John Simon's theories, um, has uh, an elegant Hilbert space structure. Um, which is sort of easy to understand and sort of is interesting. Um, all my results will be concrete in the large end context, but as I will argue at the end of the talk, some of them may generalize beyond large end. Okay, so what we're going to do in this talk is, is the following. We're going to use known results for partition functions of these large end gauge theories on S2 times S1. These are results that have been obtained by computing the partition function, you know, the path integral of these theories on S2 times S1 by summing all planar gra graphs. It's been computed over a period of about 10 years. I'm not gonna do any new computations in this talk. I'll just take this, the known result and try to interpret it. Okay, so I'm gonna have to spend three or four minutes just telling you about what the known result is. You know, it's sort of, involved enough to describe that result, that'll take some time. The first thing to say about these known results, about these matter Chern Simon's theories, is that they all take the following form. These S2 times S1 partition functions are all given by the integral of some um, uh, over a holonomy matrix, a unitary matrix, a holonomy matrix of some effective action that depends on this holonomy field. 
Now, I've written this dependence uh, not as dependence on the holonomy field, but on its eigenvalue distribution function defined here. Um, because we're in the large end limit, that's, that's a good thing to do. The measure for this integration is the hard measure with one twist. The twist is that we're integrating over all matrices which obey the pointwise condition that the, in, that the density of eigenvalues of this unitary matrix ne pointwise never exceeds 1 over 2 pi times lambda, where lambda was this Tuft coupling, n over kappa that I told you about earlier. Okay. Now, um, I told you about the structure of these, the of the of these partition functions. All theories have the same structure, have a partition function with the same structure, but different theories define what you do the integral over, what this action, this effective action V of rho is. That V of rho depends on which theory we're working. So in this talk, I will work with two theories. The first is what's sometimes called the regular fermion theory, which is just a theory of fermions, which have a mass, and then are minimally coupled to John Simons, some John Simons gauge field. The other theory I will work with is, is the critical boson theory, which is a Wilson-Fisher bosonic field theory, which is then minimally coupled to chern simons theory. And the chern simons theories that I couple to could be either SUN or UN uh, coupled. I will have, we'll hear more about that later. I've taken an example. In this example, I've got the fermions coupled to SUN theory at level kappa, essentially after integrating out the fermion, and uh, the boson to UN theory at level KB. Uh, these two theories happen to be level rank dual, dual to each other conjecturally and uh, switch between levels and ranks. Okay, so in each of these theories, com just direct computation reveals that the uh, um, that this V of rho function that we that I haven't told you about yet um, is given in the following way. The best way to present this V of rho is to compute what, uh, what we, we call in our papers the off-shell free energy, an, an object that depends on some auxiliary quantities. And then you're supposed to take that object and extremize it over these auxiliary quantities. Uh, the object depends on these auxiliary quantities and rho. And once you do this extremization, the end point of that extremization is V of rho. So instead of presenting V of rho to you, I'm just going to present the off-shell free energy, which we have to extremize. So for the fermions, the off-shell free energy is a function of the auxiliary parameter C tilde, which is, which, which is some strange thing, and CF tilde, which uh, has a physical interpretation. In units of the temperature, CF tilde is the thermal mass of, of, of the fermionic theory, the mass, uh, the thermal mass that will actually come about in the final fermionic theory. Okay, rho here is this eigenvalue density function. In terms of uh, C tilde and uh, CF tilde and C tilde, this is the off-shell free energy for the fermions. Um, it's got some messy stuff here, and then it's got a simple and beautiful piece here. We come back to that. Okay, now let's move on to the bosons. The bosons, once again, you know, you're you've got this off-shell free energy function of auxiliary parameters. You have to extremize them with respect to the auxiliary parameters in order to get the final V of rho. The off-shell free energy uh, is this thing which depends on the auxiliary par parameters S tilde and CB tilde. Once again, CB tilde is the thermal mass in units of the temperature. And uh, this, uh, it has this messy stuff, which depends on the details of contact interactions of the theory. It's not universal. And then this, this part here, which is sort of familiar looking, looks like a looks like a one-loop partition function. And then another strange piece, a piece with a theta function that kicks in only when the chemical potential of the theory is larger than the mass. Okay. Um, uh, only the last two lines of this, this theory and the last line of this theory depend on the chemical potential in any way. These, these guys are independent of the chemical potential. Fine. So, sum so in summary, both for fermions and for bosons, the final, off the final partition function, uh, S2 times S1 partition function, the thing that we're going to want to interpret in this talk, is given by uh, an expression of the sort. Uh, partition function is an integral over this modified hard measure, modified to put a cap on eigenvalue density functions of this, the extremum of this off-shell free energy. Now, in general, in general, if you had a formula like this, you couldn't say any more. Um, however, we're working at large n. And at large n, this integral over eigenvalues can be done, in fact, is dominated by saddle points. So this integral over eigenvalues is itself an extremization problem. So now we've got, ex we've got something that we've got to extremize both over eigenvalues as well as over zeta i. And we can interchange the order of the extremization and do the integral first and then integrate, then extremize over these, I, uh, these zeta i parameters. So to evaluate this S2 times S1 partition function, we need to do two things. First, we've got to extremize 
and, and this is the point of view I'm going to take in this talk. First, what I'm going to do is to evaluate the integral over u of this, this object, the fixed values of these auxiliary parameters. And I'm going to extremize this object uh, over the auxiliary parameters. Okay. The, these two steps I call step one and step two. Step one is simple, beautiful, and will form almost all of the talk. We come back to step two in the last minute of the talk. Okay. So for, for Fermi on step one is integrating over this beautiful part of the thermal part, uh, you know, the simple universal part of the partition function that I told you about uh, for the fermions. Uh, this part here, which didn't, was not messy, didn't depend on the details of the contact interactions of the theory. Uh, we need only to integrate over that part because that's the only part that depends on the eigenvalue distribution function. So as far as that integral is concerned, this stuff is constant that goes along for the right. Okay. So we need to do this, uh, this integral over this part of this uh, off-shell free energy um, over the strange uh, measure for, uh, for unitary matrices. Now, this is simple and is very simple. In what sense is it very simple? Well, this is simply the one loop partition. It's just the free partition function, free partition function of free fermions twisted with a UN um, holonomy. So pretend that the gauge uh, the holonomy the, the the holonomy is like a chemical potential for this theory where nf is a gauge field a uh, 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 global symmetry twist it with that chemical potential and just compute the free partition function of fermions that's what this thing is so in other words what we have to compute in step one is this integral over this interesting measure of the uh, a free fermion partition function the question we're going to ask is what does this mean what are we actually doing here is, is there a beautiful description of this uh, of the, the trace that we're computing in IFF. Before we get to trying to answer this question, let's look at the same question for bosons. Okay. Um, when we work this out for bosons, uh, we have to do something similar. We need to do the integral over the unitary, uh, unitary uh, over holonomies with this modified Haar measure. But of, of something that looks like a one loop determinant. And then something else, this thing with the strange theta function. Now, the strange theta function part is independent of rho, yet it's universal. It doesn't depend on the contact interactions theory, and it depends on the chemical potential. All such terms are grouping together in step one. So we need to keep these guys here. Uh, and uh, if I rewrite this as a trace, this is the integral of the trace of this one loop, this determinant kind of uh, uh, free boson partition function twisted by u, and then times this other strange piece. So both these quantities, IB, IF, and IB, have the structure, and we want to understand what the structure means. What are we actually doing? Okay. So to sort of get uh, sharpened up for this problem, let us momentarily consider a quantity that is similar to IF, similar to this quantity, but is simpler. And that, is, that simpler quantity is just replace this modified R measure by the actual R measure. So just as a warm up, as a toy model, suppose we had this IF tilde where this was the actual R measure, and this is the quantity we were computing. Then we want to know what is what over what this quantity is trace over some Hilbert space, trace of e to the power minus beta h over some Hilbert space. What is that Hilbert space? And the answer to this question is both familiar as well as simple. The answer is that you see, this integral over u just enforces a projection onto the un singlet sector of this free fermion Hilbert space, Fox space, free fermion Fox space. So this IF still does simply a trace over a free theory, namely just free fermions, but projected onto the singlet sector. So that's the template for the kind of answer we're going to look for. The question is, what is the, what, what is, what, 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 is there a similar structure that gives this answer as well as this answer? I'm going to give you the answer and then I'm going to spend, you know, five minutes explaining it. Um, the, the answer is that the question posed at the end of, the previous slide has a very simple answer. And the simple answer is that what we have to do is to take the Hilbert space of these free fermions and free bosons and then project them to a singlet, just like in our toy model. However, the singlet is not a singlet over, um, cl over classical UN theory. It's the singlet over the wesumino witten theory, wesumino witten singlet associated with the John Simons theory in question. So both to explain this answer and to explain Really, what the words I said, what the meaning of the words is that I said, I need to tell you a few things. See, S U N level K and Simon series are familiar objects. I'm going to assume you know what they are. You may be less less familiar with U N Chern Simon series. 
there's two or three complications with these, these theories. The first one is that they are defined not by one level, but by two. Roughly speaking, the first level, K, is the level for the SUN part of the UN. K prime is the level for the UN part of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, of the UN. But you know, the fact that UN is not quite UN times SUN tells us that these two levels can't be varied independently. In fact, there's a consistency condition. Consistency condition tells us that K prime is equal to kappa, which is the shifted level, plus Q times N, okay? uh, where Q is an integer. So K prime has an infinite number of possibilities, but not completely arbitrary. Uh, in my talk, there will be two values of Q, Q that will play an important role. The choice Q equals zero is particularly simple and we'll call it type one theory. And the choice Q equals minus one is also quite simple and we'll call it type two theory. Okay. Now, the reason that we have forced to study both SUN as well as UN theories, I would have loved to study just the simplest case, maybe just SUN theory. But it turns out that level rank duality mixes SUN and UN theories. In particular, the S under pure, in both pure and matter transcendence theories, SUN theories are dual to type two UN theories. Um, and uh, uh, UN type one UN theories are dual to type one UN theories. So there are no dualities involving just SUN theories. So, you know, these S UN theories may seem like a pain initially, but you need to study them if you're interested in duality. Okay. Now I gave you an ex I gave you some words to describe what I said was the partition function of my theories that had been previously computed, some cons some uh, free free Hilbert space restricted to Wessomino witten singlets, and I want to explain what that means. Well, consider John Simon's theory, George John Simon's theory on S two times S one with M Wilson lines and representations R one to R n. Over uh, long ago, over 30 years ago, Witten showed us that uh, um, the uh, uh, partition function of the John Simon series with these Wilson lines. These Wilson lines are points on the S2 and wrapping the S1, uh, wrapping the S1 once. Witten showed that the, the partition function of these, uh, uh, with, in the presence of these Wilson lines, um, were counted was an integer that counted the number of conformal blocks of Wessumino Witten theory with primaries in R1 to RM representations. Okay, so. If we want to count the number of Wessomino witten singlets, a number of conformal blocks, same as computing this, this John Simon's partition function. Now, again, about 30 years ago, Blau and Thompson did the computation of these theories. They did it in special cases, but sort of at least naively easy to extend their analysis to all, all cases. And, uh, um, and using, their, using their analysis, just evaluating this partition function of uh, John Simon's theory on S2 times S1 with these, part with these partitions, you get a formula for the number of singlets, um, uh, the number of singlets, this dimension of the space of conformal blocks with these insertions. This formula is sort of like an integral over the holonomies, like these W's are holonomy eigenvalues. But in the Blau and Thompson um, derivation, there, there's a sum over fluxes that discretizes these holonomies. And so the integral over holonomies changes to a sum over discrete possibilities. And in the formula, you have the characters of these holonomies at specified values, and then, then special rules for discretized holonomies. Okay, now this formula is sort of a bit complicated to explain in detail, and I don't have the time. I will just tell you that there's a formula that you get for SUN theory, and there's a formula you get for the UN theories, always involving some sum over possible discrete holonomies that takes the role of integrating over the uh, of the gauge group with some hard measure, uh, hard type measure. And uh, um, okay, uh, there's some story here. Uh, this, this formula is actually closely related and more or less identical to the Verlinde formula. And you can check this formula that you get by naive path integral manipulations by actually comp comparing it with the Verlinde formula. In fact, in the case of UN, there's, an addition, there's one phase factor that we couldn't reproduce from path integrals, but we just took by recasting the Verlinde formula in this form. Okay, so the final, uh, final conclusion is that, that we've got formulas for the number of conformal primaries, which uh, uh, number, of, uh, number of conformal blocks, or number of Westermino with singlets and with numbers of insertions uh, involving some sum over uh, holonomies. This sometimes are to be particularly simple in the type one case. So I'll just tell you the details there. There, all of the eigenvalues of the, of the, of the holonomy are, are, take the, are forced to be of the form uh, uh, kappa at roots of either one or minus one, depending on whether n is odd or even. Okay, and uh, the number of singlets is given by, uh, by computing this quantity, summing over all distinct 
are all collections of n eigenvalues that are distinct from each other and are all kappa roots of unity or minus one. And putting it into this formula. Okay. Fine. Yes, you have now five we're ready. Minutes. Five minutes. Now, now we're ready. Now we're ready to start uh, explaining some of the features that we found, we found before. Okay, the first feature we found before for the fermions was that all we had to do was to sum over the hard, integrate over the hard measure, but put a constraint on the fact that the hard measure, the eigenvalue distribution associated with the hard measure, could not exceed one over two, uh, two pi by lambda. That comes out immediately from this formula. Okay, that comes out immediately for this formula because you can you notice that this formula is in fact is actually just a discretization of the Weyl integral formula for computing classical numbers of you know number of classical singlets in classical group theory. This discretization, in fact, is in units of two pi one over two uh, sorry two pi divided by kappa, and becomes exact in the large n limit where kappa goes to infinity, except for one thing. The eigenvalue density function, because all I, you can't have more than one eigenvalue in a given root of unity, uh, the eigenvalue density function cannot exceed two pi by kappa times n. Because n comes from normalization of the eigenvalue, so two pi by lambda. And so this discretizes the usual hard measure, but with an upper bound in eigenvalue densities. And so that explains. So, so, so this 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 integral, uh, this sum in the uh, larger nth limit turns into this. This, this measure explaining the formula for that if in the, on the previous slide. Great, that explains it for the fermions. But what about for the bosons? You might have thought that the same thing should just be true for the bosons. We won't get this weird factor involved in the theta functions. Actually, uh, there's a twist. You see, suppose we compute the partition function over the free boson, the free, free boson Fox space, uh, twisted by this chemical potential U. That is this object here. We just have you know one factor, one sort of Bose-Einstein factor for each each single particle state. A's are the single particle states of the theory. But notice that each of these factors is a sum over infinite possible occupation numbers, and the nth occupation numbers weighted with the character of uh, the n symmetric box representation um, of of the of the gauge group. Now. Uh, there was a caution in red that I didn't read out to you, but that our in, our formulas involving integrals calculate the number of conformal blocks only when all insertions that we put are integrable, uh, are in, insertions of integrable representations. This guy goes beyond integrable representation because n goes on to infinity, goes beyond kb. Those representations are no longer integrable. Okay, the correct answer of conformal blocks for non-integrable representations with other integrable representations is that they're just zero because non-integrable representations decouple in conformal blocks. Okay, so what we are actually supposed to do is to take this formula and take each of these factors and then truncate them so that the expansion in Taylor series expansion never exceeds KB. Okay, so that's what this line KB here means. And then do the sum. But well, well, now, we, there is a simple a bit of algebra that tells you that this truncated uh, denominator is the same as an untruncated denominator multiplied by some factor. And then when we take logs, we exponentiate and take logs, we find that this factor here is just like, like it was untruncated, plus an extra factor involving the log of this one minus y by kappa, uh, y times kappa, but in the large n limit where kappa goes to infinity, this factor just becomes kappa times theta of y minus one times log w. And we get a factor of one, one such factor for each state. And then um, in doing that, uh, we build all the states that contribute have such a factor have y greater than one. Those are states where the energy lies, uh, um, uh, energy of the state lies below the chemical potential. Such states only exist when the chemical potential is larger than the energy. And when you put it all together, these additional factors here contribute to that extra weird factor for the bosons. So what we've discovered here is that matter churn Simon's theories have this Bose exclusion principle. This Bose exclusion principle, which tells you that no single particle state can be occupied more than KB times by bosons. So this is a new and new thing, and it's very interesting. It tells you that Bose condensates of three boson, three boson theories are cured by churn Simon's interactions. Okay, now what, what, we we found this we found this answer for the step one. This uh, uh, this. Uh, free answer constrained to be it uh, constrained to be uh, a Wessomino Witten singlet. Now let's take the large volume limit of this answer. In the large volume limit, something interesting happens. 
you know, the, the general answer where you're constrained to be, uh, yeah, where you're uh, uh, restricting to West amino witness singlets involves some sort of summation over these eigen, distinct possible eigenvalues. But in the large volume limit, that summation is dominated by one term, sort of by a saddle point type contribution to the sum. And that one term has eigenvalues given here. The eigenvalues that are symmetrically distributed around zero, or the, uh, or the eigenvalues are symmetrically dist distributed around one. The phases are symmetrically distributed around zero, and as packed as they can be. Okay, so in the large volume limit, this, this, uh, the sum of eigenvalues is dominated by one term. And because of that, the whole partition function here factorizes into product of partition functions, one for each single particle state. Now that's sort of very cool, because normally factorization into one partition function for each single particle state happens only in free theories. It happens in the free boson Fox space or free fermion Fox space. Here, what you have is that this happens at all values of the Stoft coupling lambda. And the single particle partition functions uh, that, we, that, we get, that, that we get are sort of like a Q deformations, Q deformations of the free boson, free boson partition function. Uh, what, what appears here is instead of there being a combinatorial factor that counts the number of ways of putting some number of particles in some uh, in a state, uh, you get a quantum dimension of the n box completely symmetric representation. Okay, but these quantum dimensions are given in Q numbers listed here. Similar uh, formulas hold for fermions and they both Fermi du uh, dual, uh, dual to each other. So now you might think, well, we've discovered a sort of new free limit of these theories with new free statistics. Actually, there's a caution. Um, this free limit is not quite free, as you can see from the fact that the coefficients of expansion terms here are not integers. Actually, what's going on in these theories is that the interaction is not going away. It's not really true that, that what we're doing when we're counting a single particle state, a partition function is only the particles in that state. What, what, what's actually happening is that the in, interaction between these particles, uh, because of the singlet condition, continues to apply. However, there's a sort of universality that comes and makes this product fall. And um, um, uh, the, 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 the universality um, has, 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 has its roots in you know, universality of products of representations of West Women theory. Um, I, I won't tell you about that. I have to, I have to wrap up in a minute. So. You have Fine. three minutes in the question. You're already in the question time. A question period. So half a minute I stop. <laughs> yes. So, um, uh, OK. This Bose exclusion principle for these, for these theories stabilizes potential Bose condensation instabilities in these theories. And uh, um, the, the, these partition functions here give us new free types statistics that are one parameter deformation of the statistics of free Bose theories and free Fermi theories. And they join the two in a, in a sort of interesting way. Um, OK. Uh, Step two is boring. I won't tell you about it. I don't have the time. Let me just flash the conclusions paragraph and stop here. Thank you. Mukund. Hi, Shiraz. I was curious Hi, if you could comment about uh, the holographic side, especially with respect to these auxiliary parameters and what this uh, uh, um, Bose exclusion principle means if you're looking at, say, some ABGM type theory. Okay. Uh, now, you know, I should start with caveats. Right? The caveats are that we've only explored this Bose exclusion, this Bose exclusion principle, we know for sure only to be true in these vector like large end limits. Right? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, having said that, I'll tell you what I think. What, what, I, what I think is going, you know, there is this interesting thing about ABGM theory uh, that we've understood technically in index type and in partition function type calculations, but I think I've never understood really physically. Um, and that is the fact that while uh, the free energy of n equals four Yangle's theory varies from uh, um, zero to three fourths, uh, oh, sorry, one to three fourths as we take uh, lambda from zero to infinity, the free energy of, uh, um, of, uh, uh, of these uh, uh, ABGM theories vary from one to one over square root of lambda, if I remember, right? Mm -hmm. As we take lambda from zero to infinity. So, you know, turning on lambda is, involves a huge cut down in number of states. Right. And uh, uh, the question is, why do these theories behave so differently? And I believe that the reason underlying it is, is uh, uh, this 
this singlet constraint is greatly cutting down degrees of freedom. These Westermino Witten singlet constraints cut down degrees of freedom much more severely than ordinary Gauss law constraints do. As is apparent from the fact that uh, in the volume goes to infinity limit, the Gauss law singlet con constraint just goes away, but the Westermino Witten constraint stays, as I tried to show you in this, mm -hmm. in this, in this part. Yeah. Any other very quick question? Okay. Quick comment. Don't see any. Okay. Quick, great. Please go ahead. On that, on that last remark, maybe I'm misunderstanding. But I thought maybe the reason that the WCW constraint is more constraining than a Gauss law constraint is that the typical Gauss law constraint would simply be in, on the integral of the charge. But here, it's simply not possible to have a particle with more than a certain charge. So it's kind of a local constraint in the way the other one is not. Okay, I'm not sure I completely understood that, but it's at least it goes in the right direction, the, the direction of my understanding. This, well, you can, yeah. Please go. Well, let me explain that. Uh, you, you, can't, uh, you, can have, you can't have a Wilson operator with more than a certain charge. So you can't probe the impure, you can't probe the system with a charge bigger than a certain highest weight. Or more yes. exactly, you could try to use a Wilson operator of higher charge, but it's actually equivalent to one of lower charge. Yes. So that's a local phenomenon that you can't have a local charge bigger than something. Whereas a yes. Gauss constraint only says that the integrated charge is zero. Yes, perfectly. I agree with that. I agree with that. So it, for this reason, it doesn't even go away in the in the infinite volume limit. The Gauss law, as 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 Ed said, is just one constraint in all the degrees of freedom in the in the huge universe. And who cares about that constraint? Whereas this is much more because it's sort of local. So yeah, survives in the uh, the the uh, in the infinite volume limit. And but it but you know the interesting thing about that is though it survives, and perhaps that's presaged by your remark, it becomes universal. It, it, this constraint does not stop the partition function from factorizing into a partition functions one for each in a single particle energy state. Mm -hmm. uh, because there's a certain universality of the, uh, of the number of operators produced when you have very large numbers of uh, uh, representations under the West amino Witten fusion rules, uh, which comes about from the fact that there's this universal uh, um, holonomy matrix that dominates the integral at this, at this point. Yeah, well, th that I find kind of surprising. Suppose you'd had a lattice theory. Yes. In other words, suppose the charges were only allowed on the lattice. Yes. Then you said that on each lattice site, you can't have more than a certain charge. Yes. But you also would have said that, let's say for two neighboring lattice sites, they can't be coupled for more than a certain charge. So although you'd have a constraint on each lattice point, that wouldn't be the whole story. So yes. what I find surprising about your answer isn't that you got a much stronger constraint what I find surprising about your answer is just that you, you get independent constraints for each single particle state. Uh, and if the chairman will give you one minute, I could uh, try to explain my understanding of that more clearly. Okay, one minute. Uh, <laughs> okay, so my understanding of that is the, is, is the following. I claim the following. I claim that if you take um, a bunch of representations um, and the number of repre representations is, is taken to be very large, um, the largest number in the problem, larger than anything else. Then you ask, in fact, I've written this somewhere. And then, then you ask, how may, when you fuse them all together, how many representations of type Ri do you get? The number of, the number of representations of type Ri will depend on, what, on the details of what you fused. The number of representations of Rj will depend on the details, but the ratio will not. The ratio of these two will, will be in the ratio of the quantum dimensions of these two, uh, of these two representations. And uh, the way I see this is that my partition, my, my partition function from, from the path integral point of view is dominated by a particular eigenvalue configuration. And so the number of representations then just turns into the character evaluated on that, that representation. And this representation, sorry, not represented, uh, this particular matrix, the character evaluated on that matrix is very special. And in fact, is this quantum dimension. Uh, so if you think about it, th that sort of at least suggests what I just said. But it, it's, an exp it's a potential explanation for why we get this uh, product structure, which we do get. Thanks. Okay. So since we're out of time, I have to cut it off here. But thank you very much, Shigas. Thank you, Veronica, for being so kind with the time. <laughs>